Okay, um, so I guess uh, before we begin, we're going to discuss tonight a little bit about uh, Shavuos. Um, it would, of course, uh, be appropriate to make mention of Achenu um, Bnei Yisrael um, in Eretz Yisrael, who are um, obviously going through very difficult times. Um, and the, the learning that we're getting together tonight uh, to do in anticipation of Shavuos um, should be a, a zuchus uh, for, for their uh, protection and for their Yeshua, um, and that should happen uh, very soon. Okay, um, so um, we've, um, the past few months uh, in Nissan and ER, we talked a little bit about um, the, the, some of the things that are going on in the month. Um, so for Sivan, I wanted to focus specifically on on Shavuos, um, which is really uh, the, you know the main uh, focal point of, of the month of Sivan. Um, and I um, uh, on the we're going to look at a few things on the on the source sheet that I handed out. Although if you don't have it, that's uh, that's fine. Um, so we know that Shavuos is going to begin next uh, this this Sunday evening, which is the sixth day of Sivan. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because the, um, we know that if you look in the Torah, actually, um, there's really no mention in the Torah made, uh, to the connection of Shavuos and the giving of the Torah. Um, the Torah describes, uh, we talked about last month, how you count the days from Pesach until you reach, uh, Shavuos. But the Torah does not really uh, describe Shavuos as the day on which the Torah was given. Um, in fact, the Torah tells us in Parshas Yisro, where we talk about the events surrounding the Torah being given, uh, Matan Torah, um, and there's no date given there. It doesn't tell us the date that it happened. And in fact, not only does it not tell us the date, the Sukkim there are very, very cryptic. It's almost as if like the Torah is like avoiding uh, giving us any information. It's like purposely, in a sense, avoiding a date tied to Matan Torah. So much so that if you look on the on the first of the sword sheet, um, this is a Gemara in Maseches Shabbos. The Gemara says, Tanu Rabbanon, the rabbi said, Bashishi v'chodesh nitnu aseres hadibros liyisrael, that the aseres hadibros um, were given to the Jewish people on the sixth day of Sivan. While Rabbi Yossi Omer, Rabbi Yossi said, B'chivabo. he said they were given on the seventh day. So not only do we not have a date for Shavuos in the Torah, in the Gemara, we have really an argument as to when even Shavuos took place, whether it was on the sixth day of Sivan or on the seventh day of Sivan. Now, what's more perplexing is that um, we don't uh, have a, um, we, sorry, we, we, we celebrate uh, Shavuos on the sixth day of Sivan, okay, which would seem to be in line with the opinion of the rabbis. What's very, very troubling is that if you look in the Gemara, and it's somewhat complicated, so I didn't put it on the sheet, you'll have to take my word for it, but it appears from the Gemara, in fact, that Rabbi Yossi was correct, and that indeed the correct date for the giving of the Torah, the Aser Sadibros, that Hashem spoke to the Jewish people took place on the seventh day of Sivan, not on the sixth day of Sivan. So we really have like a, a, a double-sided problem here. On the one hand, the Torah itself is not really associating Shavuos, the giving of the Torah. And, on the, and, and second of all, not only that, the day on which we commemorate the giving of the Torah does not really seem to be the accurate day because the Gemara tells us that Rabbi Yossi was actually correct, and the correct day that the Torah was given was on the seventh day of Sivan, and yet here we are, uh, for all these many years, celebrating it on the sixth day of Sivan. So how, do we, how do we make sense of that? I'd like to share with you two different uh, approaches uh, for this tonight, um, and um, the first one really is, uh, is an idea that, that really comes from something else um, regarding Matan Torah. And that is, we know that where was the Torah given? The Torah was given on Har Sinai. And um, if you look, um, you know, you would expect, uh, some people point out, that the Torah would be given in Eretz Yisrael, in the Holy Land of Israel. Um, maybe perhaps the place of the Beis HaMikdash would be an appropriate place for Hashem to hear the Jewish people and give them the Torah. But no, no, the Torah is not given in Eretz Yisrael. And in fact, um, it's given in the middle of a desert, in the middle of nowhere. and um, 
And, and many Mephorshim deal with this issue. Like, why is this that Hashem chooses the middle of the desert and some unknown place like our Sinai to give the Torah? And not only that, uh, we are told that after um, the Torah is given at Harsinai, um, Harsinai doesn't have any more Kedusha, it's gone. The Torah was given there, that was obviously a great, fantastic event, but once uh, the, that, that event is over, it's finished. So what is the idea behind that? Um, many suggest that perhaps the idea of that is that Hashem gives the Torah in a place which doesn't appear to us to be special and important. Um, in our Sinai in the middle of the desert, um, really conveys the concept that the Torah itself um, is doesn't warrant an important place in order to be studied and in order to be accessed. The Torah itself was given by God in a place which was insignificant, and therefore the Torah can be accessed from any place, no matter how insignificant it may be. Um, Similar idea, we see um, the Torah says that when Hashem tells Moshe, Moshe sees Hashem by the burning bush. And what does Hashem tell Moshe? He says, Take off your shoes from where you are standing. The place where you're standing is holy ground. So what's the concept there? There's a few ideas, but one idea the Chavetz Chaim says is that what is the shoe? The shoe is what we put on when we're moving from place to place. So Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, he says, you know, take off your shoes. You're in a holy place, the place where the Torah is going to be given. Take off your shoes. There's no need to move. There's no need to go somewhere else. Torah can be accessed right here, right where you are. Um, and perhaps that similar idea is maybe what the Torah is doing here by not associating a specific day to the giving of the Torah, in the sense that there's no one day, almost by, by avoiding the day that the Torah is associated with, the Torah almost expresses the idea that every day is open to accessing the Torah. There isn't one day, so to speak, which is like the day of the Torah. There's really any day. So we almost deliberately, we, we give the wrong day um, in order to, in essence, basically say that every day is open to learning the Torah. Similar concept, like they say, right? You know, there's Mother, you know, we just had uh, Mother's Day and we're going to have Father's Day coming up soon, right? And then, you know, there's Thanksgiving. And like the famous thing is always said, right? In, in, in Judaism, we don't have a Mother's Day, a Father's Day, and Thanksgiving, because having a day for that implies that, like, that, that is the day for that and no other days. And, and we say, no, every day is Mother's Day and every day is Father's Day because we have a mitzvah, keep it up, aim. And every day is Thanksgiving, so to speak. So, similar concept here that there's no one day which is pinned to the Torah. Uh, because the Torah, again, is not pinned to a certain day. It's also not pinned to a certain place, as we see by Har Sinai. Another similar idea um, is from Rosh Hashanah Far Hirsch, and he says this by the, by the Mishkan. And he says, if you notice by the Mishkan, there are many items in the Mishkan which have poles attached to them. Mizbeach has poles, the Shulchan has poles, different things in the Mishkan had poles. And the Torah tells us that when it comes to the Aron, the Aron's poles were not allowed to be removed from the Aron. Now, Rosham Shunafar Hirsch asks, why, why is that? What would be the purpose of having poles in, in an item which is just staying there? You're not even moving it. The Torah says, even when you put the Aron down and they came to a place to camp, you can't move the poles. Well, what would be the point of having poles in an Aron if, if you don't need to move the Aron? So Sham Shunafar Hirsch says that the message there in the Torah is this idea again, is that the Torah has to be something which is, so to speak, always available to the mind. The Torah is never set down, so to speak, in one place. It always has the poles there. It's always potentially transportable because the Torah has to be something which is we take, which we take with us and is applied to every place. So the Torah, again, I think that's lesson number one is that, you know, by avoiding a date for Shavuos, essentially we see this theme, right? The Torah is not bound or is not pinned down to a specific place. The Torah is not bound to a specific time. And I think we could even extend that that the Torah is not bound and pinned down to a specific person. Okay. So it's open to all of us at all times and at all places. Okay. 
Now, um, to take that, this, this, uh, to deal with this question now on another level, I want to take a look at number two. And number two in the source sheet says the following idea. It's from the Gemara as well. And the Gemara says, Titania. The Gemara talk, Shlosha Devarim. Also, Moshe Mikato. There are three things that Moshe did um, based on his own decision. Not being told by Hashem to do them, he chose this on his own. But Hashem agreed uh, to what Moshe did, and he approved it. What are the three things he did? So we're going to read all three, just for the sake of learning it, but we're going to focus on one of them. Hosif Yom Echad Midato. He added on one day on his own decision. We're going to explain what that means in a moment. He separated from being intimate with his wife, Tzipporah. Uh, because he felt that Hashem could appear to him at any time, and therefore he separated from her. The Shavar es Luchos, and when he came down the mountain and he saw them doing the Egel, he broke the Luchos. The three things the Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu decided these on his own, without um, any specific directive from them, and Hashem approved of all these three things. What is the first thing Moshe Rabbeinu did? It says, Hosif Yom Echad Midato, added one day um, on his own. What's that referring to? So the Gemara there says that, you see, Hashem came to Moshe and Hashem says to Moshe, I want you to tell the Jewish people in Parshish Yisrael to prepare for the giving of the Torah. And I want them to prepare for three days. What he tells them is going to be a three-day preparation period. Now, what Hashem meant, the Gemara says, was that they were supposed to prepare on day one, prepare on day two. And on day three, Hashem was going to give them the Torah, okay? Um, and the Gemara says this was on Wednesday. So it would be a Wednesday preparation, a two, uh, Thursday preparation, and on day, fr- on day three, on Friday, Hashem was going to present the Torah to the Jewish people. What happened? What in fact happened was that the Gemara says Moshe Rabbeinu made some sort of logic. And he came up with this idea that when Hashem told him to prepare for three days, that the Torah would not be given on the third day, but rather there would be three full days of preparation, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And the Torah then would be given on job. Okay? So Hashem planned for the Torah, so to speak, to be given on Friday. And Moshe, Hosif Yom Echad Midato, on his own, he followed a certain line of logic, and the Gemara goes through that, how he arrived at this conclusion. And he said... It must be based on other things that Hashem has told me that the correct day, so to speak, for the giving of the Torah should be Shabbos. Now, this is very interesting, right? Hashem has an idea of when the Torah should be given, and Moshe comes up with his own idea. Not only does Moshe come up with his own idea, Hashem agrees to that. He says, I'll go with your idea over mine. Going back to our question in the beginning about the correct date of Shavuos, not only are we celebrating Shavuos just in general, on the incorrect day, so to speak. It's supposed to be on the 7th of Sivan that we got the Torah. And we celebrate Shavuos on the 6th of Sivan. Interesting, we're actually celebrating Shavuos on the planned day of Matan Torah. That was supposed to be the day. Hashem said, Wednesday, Thursday, you'll prepare. Friday, you'll get the Torah, which was the 6th day of Sivan. And that's when we're celebrating Shavuos. When did they actually get the Torah? the day later, on the 7th. So not only are we celebrating on the wrong day, we're celebrating specifically on the day, which was Hashem's planned day of giving the Torah, and yet Moshe, so to speak, clicked an override and pushed it off a day. So what's the idea behind this? Um, So I'd like to share with you um, a concept which I I heard um, from uh, a Rabbi Hartman uh, from England. Um, and uh, when I was in Israel, he shared the following uh, concept, um, which which was really very interesting, a different perspective of Shavuos. Um, and it's really based on um, a, a Gemara, a famous Gemara, um, which many may have heard, but I put it on the sheet, and I'd like to read it together with you. It's number three in the source sheet. This Gemara um, involves a, a great uh, dispute that took place between two parties. One was the general, the rabbis, and the other was someone named Rebbe Eliezer. 
And Rabbi Eliezer and the rabbis were having an argument um, about the status of a certain kind of oven. And there was a question as to whether the oven was tamay or tahor. That was the question about this oven. And, um, okay, so they disagreed about this and they, they really couldn't come to an agreement on it. And the Gemara tells us that amidst their machlokas, uh, something fascinating happened. So it says, Tana, number three. Ba'oso hayom, heishiv Rabbi Eliezer kol teshubos shaba'olam v'lo kiblu himenu. Rabbi Eliezer tried uh, to apply all different types of logic and explanations as to why his approach on this oven should be followed, and everyone rejected it. Then it says the famous part, Im Amar lahem. Then Rabbi Eliezer got up and he said, forget logic. Im halacha kemosi. If I am correct about this oven, charuv ze yochiach. The carob tree should prove that I'm correct. What happened? Ne'akar charuv memukomo me'ama. The carob tree was ripped out of the ground, a uh, hundred amos, and Amrulo, the rabbi said, that's a fantastic trick that you've done, but you can't bring a proof from there. We still disagree with you. So then round two, he then said, if the halacha follows me, then I want the river to prove that I'm correct. And lo and behold, the river started flowing back. Amrulo, the rabbi said, can't bring a proof from the fact the river flowed backwards. We still believe that you are incorrect. Third time around, he said the walls of the Bismedra should prove that I am correct. And miraculously, what happened? The walls started to cave in. He took Kosle Bismedrish Luka. Began to fall. Gar Bohem Rabbi Yehoshua. Rabbi Yehoshua was there, looked at the walls of the base Medrash, so to speak, like in, you know, amazement, like how could they collapse on everyone? Amar lahem, and he said, Im talmidei chachamim natzchem ze ze bahalacha. If the talmidei chachamim are here studying in the base Medrash, atem ma what is the, what, what is your purpose? The whole purpose of the base Medrash, of the walls, here, provide a place for the people to study. So how could you collapse on everyone? So lo naflu mipnei kavodo sh Rabbi Yehoshua. The walls therefore stopped and didn't fall, as the Rebbe Yehoshua's point. Velo zakfu, but they didn't go completely back up if they could go to Rebbe Eliezer, because Rebbe Eliezer said that the walls should collapse and prove that he was correct. Adayin matin ba'omdin. The walls were kind of, uh, you know, in the middle. So, three things Rebbe Eliezer tried. They wouldn't follow. Chazar v'amar lahem. So he makes one attempt, one more, and he says the famous thing, im halacha kamosi men hashamayim yochichu. How about this? He says, I believe that I'm correct, and I want them to announce from heaven that I'm correct. And what happened? Yatasa Basko Vamra, a Basko went out and it said, Malochem Eitzel Rabbi Eliezer, Shahalacha Kemosa Bachomako. So a heavenly voice went out, and the heavenly voice said, Indeed, the halacha follows Rabbi Eliezer. So it said that he was correct. So Three things in nature changed, and a heavenly voice came out. At which point, Ahmad, Rabbi Yehoshua, Rabbi Yehoshua stood up, and he said, Amar, three famous words, Lo, Bashamayim, He. The Torah is not in heaven. My Lo, Bashamayim, He. What does it mean the Torah is not in heaven? Amar, Rabbi Yirmiya, Rabbi Yirmiya said, this means, Shekavar Nitna Torah, Meher Sinai. The Torah was given at Har Sinai. In Anu Mashkichin Bebaskol. We therefore do not pay any attention to a heavenly voice. Shekvar kasavta bahar Sinai b'Torah acherei rabin lahatos. The Torah already said that you should follow the majority. So essentially, he said the Torah was given with a certain set of rules, and once Hashem gave those set of rules to determine what the rules should be, the halacha should be for the Torah, and we follow those rules. Those are the rules we follow. And even a voice from heaven is disregarded as long as we followed the proper rules to determine what we should do in the Torah. Okay, so interesting Gemara. The Gemara concludes with something even more interesting. So it says that Eliyahu Hanavi um, was greeted by one of the rabbis in the Gemara, Rabbi Nassim. And he said to him, Amar le my avid kucha brichu was God doing at that moment 
when the heavenly voice went out and they got up, the rabbis got up and said, we disregard the heavenly voice. We're not paying attention to what Hashem said. We're following what we believe to be the truth. What was Hashem doing? Omar Lay, Eliyahu Hanavi said to him, Kachayich, Hashem was smiling. The Omar and Hashem said, Nitzchuni banai, Nitzchuni banai. My children have defeated me. My children have defeated me. Now, this Gemara requires a lot of explanation in the following. You would think that if Hashem um, sends out a voice from heaven to tell the people what the halacha is, there should be no great, no greater proof of what the halacha is than that. Hashem himself said, the halacha follows Rabbi Eliezer. And yet, what happened? They disregarded Rabbi Eliezer, and they followed what they believed to be the correct logic. How can this be true? How does this work this way? So... One of the great uh, commentators on the Gemara, uh, Rabbi Nisim, Ran, um, who lived in the 1300s in Spain. So anyone who's learned Gemara knows about the Ran. He's located in the back of the Gemara and he comments on the Gemara. The Ran also wrote a book of, of Machshava, a philosophy called the Drasho Saran. And he deals with this question there and he says, how can this be? Anytime, you know, two rabbis are arguing about something, whether it be rabbis in the Gemara, or, you know, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and Rabbi El Yashiv, or you go to the rabbi of your shul and someone else goes to the rabbi of another shul. Anytime two rabbis are arguing about something, essentially what they're arguing about is when they're disagreeing about a point in Jewish law, they're each trying to figure out what does Hashem want from me in this certain situation? Okay, certain situation. Can we do this on Shabbos? Yes or no? You know, so one rabbi says you can do it on Shabbos, other rabbi says you can't. You're trying to figure out what would Hashem say about the situation on Shabbos. So the Ron says, how can this be that if Hashem himself tells us what to do in this situation, we would disregard Hashem in the face of one of the rabbis? Both the rabbis are trying to figure out what Hashem himself said. It would be like two children arguing, right? And, and one, one of your kids says, you know, um, you know, mom would love this for her birthday. I know she would really like this. And uh, your other child says, you know, no, 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 I think mom would love this for her birthday. Not A, mom would love B. And, and you hear this and you say to your kid, no, you know, actually what I would like, what I would like is C. That's really what would make me happy. And your kids say, no, nah, just you stay out of it. You're just mom, just, just stay out of it. We got this, right? We're, we're, we're working on this. It'd be very strange. So the Ron says, interestingly enough, that what happens is the, the way the Ron explains this and um, it's just a very foundational uh, point for understanding the way the Torah works in general, at least from the Ron's point of view, is that, you know, Hashem gave Moshe Rabbeinu the Torah. He gives him a set of principles, I would say, or almost like axioms. And he doesn't tell Moshe Rabbeinu necessarily the answer to every single point to come from now until the end of time. And instead, he gives Moshe Rabbeinu the principles, and these are the core principles and ingredients with which Jews are to then apply and figure out the answers to questions that arise about the Torah over time. And Hashem purposely does this instead of giving us the Torah and saying, you know, um, yep, and there's an answer to, you know, whether you can use electricity on Shabbos or not, but I, you know, don't, don't open the Torah to that page until, you know, the 1800s when electricity comes out. Or, you know, there's an answer as to whether you should take the vaccine or not take the vaccine and open it in 2021, right? Hashem doesn't do that. Hashem gives Abel Moshe Rabbeinu certain principles, and we then are supposed to apply those principles over the generations to try to figure out what the halacha should be. And the Ran says that what's going on there is, is that even though Hashem himself, or so to speak, might have decided an, object, an objective truth to a certain answer, Hashem is more interested in the workings of the Jewish people in terms of what they come up with the Torah, so to speak, more so than his own objective feeling about what should be. Okay? Now, obviously, this, this can get a little dangerous, right? Meaning the Ran is not saying that every person can just make up whatever they want with the Torah, right? What has to be done here is this has to be, you know, Authority, who is who um, you know who who is authorized to make decisions about the Torah, to apply these principles appropriately and correctly. And when A, it's an authority who's authorized to do so, applies B, the principles given to him by Hashem. So then Hashem goes with that halacha, so to speak, even to the extent if it goes against what Hashem's, so to speak, original objective idea was. 
Marshall, I heard to explain this is the following idea. Now, why, why, why would Hashem do this? So, you know, it's like a parent wants to um, celebrate the child's birthday. So um, they decide they're gonna have a cake at the birthday. Now, there's two ways for there to be a cake at the birthday. The parent could bake the cake for the child. You wait till your kid goes to sleep. You bake the cake. Everything is done efficiently, cleanly, you know, in a timely fashion. And the next day you have the cake for the birthday. One way to do it. The other way to deal with the cake is that have your child bake the cake with you. And you provide all of the ingredients for the cake. Okay. But the child is there with you. Now it's true. When you bake the cake with the child, the kitchen is going to get a lot more messy. Um, perhaps certain parts are not going to be mixed evenly, and it's not going to bake evenly, and part of it might, you know, be one way, and other part of it would be another way, and the ingredients might not be evenly dispersed, and there might be an eggshell somewhere in there, and there's going to be oil on the floor, and things all over the place. It might look a lot more messy, but there's a lot, it, it's a lot more meaningful, and you bake the cake with the child, and the child has an active part in baking the cake. Other than you just cleanly making a cake and giving to the child, you end up with the same cake, or not the same cake, but a cake. But in one way of going about it, the child is involved, and there's a lot, lot more love and meaning in it. So the Ron says that Hashem gave the Jewish people a set of principles by which those who are authorized to understand the Torah can use those principles and apply them to scenarios which come up in the Torah. And that is Hashem's way of inviting us, so to speak, to be a part of his Torah. Now, what's fascinating, pulling this all together, when was the first time, so to speak, in history that that occurred? That God invited us part of the decision-making process of his Torah. So when did that happen? So the first time that happened actually was on the 6th. On the 6th of Sivan, Hashem says, I plan to give the Torah. The days of preparation are Wednesday and Thursday, and I will give the Torah on Friday. And what happens? Moshe, based on certain rules of logic, says to Hashem, the Torah should not be given today on Friday. The Torah should be given tomorrow on Shabbos. And what happens at that very first moment on Vav Sivan, on that Friday? Hashem concedes. First, Moshe Rabin. So the 6th of Sivan that year was the very first time that Hashem deferred his objective truth to a person who was applying the rules given to him by Hashem to determine what something should be regarding the Torah is then something that continued all the way down until this very day. So Rabbi Hartman suggested that perhaps what is being acknowledged or celebrated, so to speak, on the 6th of Sivan is not necessarily the giving of the Aseris and Dibros, which took place really on the 7th, but what's being acknowledged is Hashem's being open to the human being partnership with him in helping him build his and that's what's going on and with that he answered another famous question you know we know that on Shavuos one holiday where there's no unique mitzvah right we know that in uh when it comes to Pesach so you have matzah and so we have a little nesro on Rosh Hashanah we have the shofar and on Shavuos there's no unique mitzvah and perhaps the idea behind that is, one idea behind that is probably that because there can't be one specific mitzvah laid down in the Torah, right? The Torah represents the totality of all mitzvahs. You can't pick one mitzvah to say this, this, this mitzvah encapsulates the message of the theme of the day. Because the Torah really represents the totality of all mitzvahs. So therefore, there, there is no mitzvah. That, that's one approach, and there's a lot of truth to that. But on, on, on another level, Rabbi Hartman suggested that on that day, on Vav Sivan, there's no specific mitzvah because what happened on that day? The answer is, is that nothing happened. Something was supposed to happen on that day. Their Sadibros were supposed to be conveyed to the Jewish people on 
that day. But in truth, in actuality, what ended up happening after Moshe Rabbeinu um, applied the rules of the Torah, he concluded that the correct day for the giving of the Torah should be on Shabbos and gave into that. So there's no mitzvah of the day, perhaps, because nothing occurred. And that would also explain then why we celebrate on the sixth, not on the seventh, because the celebration or the acknowledgement of the day is again allowing us to be partners with Hashem's Torah, which kind of ties in, I think, to the first idea we said based on the concept you know, Harsinai being given in a place which is significant in the sense that Torah is open to any time, to any place, any person. Torah is open to all of us. And, and not only is the Torah open to all of us, Hashem actually says, defer in a certain way. When done properly, I will even defer my line of thinking, so to speak, to the line of thinking person. Um, and with that, I will uh, leave you all uh, with... Um, Wishes for a Chag Kasher Sameach and a wonderful uh, Yamtif of uh, Shavuos. Thank you.